Um, my name's Edward Heinemann. I work uh, in IFAD. I work in the office of the Associate Vice President for Operations. Um, and I'm going to be moderating this session on poverty targeting. Um, I think this is a, a really interesting, well, promises to be a really interesting session. Um, I mean, firstly, because um, notions of targeting, some form of targeting, seems to me so central to all policies and investments that have at their heart uh, an explicit objective to reduce inequality. Um, but secondly, also because uh, for IFAD, targeting is very much um, an article of faith. Um, it's uh, something which is much debated within IFAD. Um, and um, in those discussions, there is sometimes blood left on the, left on the floor. So it's, a, it's an issue that actually we're very passionate about within, within the House. Um, the way we, we're organizing this session is, is uh, a bit different to some of the others. We have uh, a panel of, um, of four. Let me start by introducing them. Uh, ben Davis has, is back, um, <laughs> this time as, uh, as a speaker. Um, ben Davis is leader of the strategic program to reduce rural poverty in FAO. Um, his experience is in social protection, social policies, and agricultural economics. Um, he's worked uh, previously in the Agricultural, Deve Agricultural Development Economics Division at FAO, um, and he's also worked previously at UNICEF and IFPRI. Uh, we then have uh, Shitra, Shitra Deshpande, who works um, as a senior evaluation officer in the Independent Office of Evaluation in IFAD. Um, her experience spans both public and private sectors. Um, she's worked um, particularly development and, and gender issues. She was formerly um, special advisor to the vice president here in IFAD. Uh, she works as a portfolio advisor in the Asia division, and she's worked at, at FAO uh, uh, and the World Bank and WFP as a gender and development specialist. Uh, Michael, Michael Grimm, uh, is a professor of development economics at the University of Passau. He's also a research professor at the German Institute of uh, economic research in Berlin, uh, a fellow at ISEA uh, in Bonn, and affiliate of the RWI Research Network. Uh, his research covers problems related to poverty and growth, uh, issues such as human capital, informal labor markets, technology adoption in, in, in agriculture, uh, including evaluation of policy interventions. And he's currently coordinating a research project on female and youth empowerment in Tunisia, um, which is being supported by IFAD and ILO. Um, and, and last but not least, uh, Estrella Panunia, who is the Secretary General of the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development. Um, AFA is a, a regional farmers organization, uh, currently with some 20 <coughs> national farmers organizations across 16 Asian countries. Uh, its programs include capacity building, knowledge management, policy advocacy, and internal governance. Uh, AFA co-manages a capacity building project um, uh, for farmers' uh, organizations across Asia, which is supported by IFAD, um, the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, and the EU. Um, so the way this session is going to work is that um, uh, we're going to really have a chat. Um, I'm going to pose uh, a first question to each of the participants, um, and then we're going to go straight into discussion. And I hope that in this session we'll have um, substantial time for discussion. Um, we have this uh, mentee thing, um, which you can use, uh, which I think has been explained to you. Um, and uh, we're also using what I'm told is an adapted fishbowl uh, approach. Uh, you're very welcome to ask questions from where you are, uh, but you're also encouraged, um, and please don't feel uh, embarrassed to do so, to join us in those, two, um, in those two remaining seats. Of course, as soon as you've asked your question, you'll be told to go back and sit down again. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I hope there'll be a 
there'll be time for a, a substantive and, and, and rich discussion. Let me start, though, by uh, posing a question to Ben. Um, in your role as, as leader of the strategic program to reduce rural poverty, um, why don't you give us some of the sort of the, the big ticket lessons you've learned about reducing rural poverty and inequality? And sort of link to that, um, it would be interesting to understand the, the, some of the challenges that um, that FAO has faced as it's sought to infuse a poverty perspective into, in, into what are largely technical functions. Okay. Um, well, thanks. Yeah, in the, um, I guess what I'd like to start with is just kind of explaining uh, what my role is because really the, the you know, we're, we've, we've reorganized at FAO. We now have these five strategic programs, which is basically about trying to focus better what FAO does because FAO pretty much does everything, right? It's very divert, I mean, dispersed. It, it's uh, very heterogeneous. And we wanted to focus our activities uh, really within the context of the, of the 2030 agenda, right? And so the particular strategic program that I lead is around reducing rural poverty. And it, it's really all about how can we better focus what FAO does on, uh, on helping countries achieve SDG 1, right? Always within the context of you can't really separate SDGs 1 and 2 in order to, to, uh, to end hunger. You need to address rural poverty and, and vice versa. And surprisingly, this is a somewhat novel concept for FAO, right? Um, because you know, it's a very technical agency. There is a, it's very technically oriented, whether it's in agriculture, fisheries, forestry, the work on climate change, et cetera, right? Um, and essentially, our role has been to challenge the the the, the technical uh, the technical divisions to be much more uh, explicit about what they're doing, right, and who they're targeting, and what is their end game, right? What is their their theory of change as to actually how they're going to affect hunger and, and poverty? Because I think there is this kind of implicit understanding: well, everything we does, of course, affects poverty, right? Um, but in fact. Uh, um, in practice, uh, when you push people on it, it's, it's actually um, uh, um, uh, not so clear, right? And so, and we've been doing that a number of ways. One is is really just um, uh, again pushing people to be much more clear in terms of uh, uh, the poverty implications of the work they do, because anything technically that you do is by de it's, it, nothing is neutral, right? In, in a sense, there is going to be uh, either winners or losers, different kinds of impacts, and it's important to be explicit in terms of what, what that impact is going, going to be. No? Second, I think, is, is in focusing on making the different uh, um, work that we're supporting more inclusive, right? And so it's really about, you know, when you're supporting smallholder production, um, you need to focus on um, the inclusive aspect, right? So making that um, accessible and focusing on those who are more marginal, more vulnerable, the, the particular constraints that they face in terms of trying to build sustainable, livelihood, sustainable livelihoods in agriculture and whether it's in terms of you know, access to information, to services, to produce organizations, um, um, et cetera. Second is uh, very much trying to link the, this idea that you can't really have rural development without linking um, uh, livelihood strategies with um, social dimensions, and particularly linking uh, the work that we do to um, different social policies, and particularly social protection. Right, and so the uh, the fact that again, one of the basic character characteristics of, of smallholder producers is uh, is risk, is just the inherent risk in their livelihood strategy, and then the fact that most of them don't have ways to manage risk, and so. Um, and so they certainly don't have formal instruments, and so having access to social protection is a fundamental way of being able to, to manage risk, as well as to have access to some kind of liquidity um, and, and what have you. And so uh, an important part of our work has been trying to, um, in terms of working with countries, is making this link between uh, the social protection work and, and the fact that most of the beneficiaries of social programs are, in fact, sustainable, um, are, are, are small-scale producers, and that you can't separate out the social and the productive sphere of what, of what they're doing. No? Now, I think um, uh, in trying to embed all of this work, in trying 
not to be sectoral in trying to embed everything that we're doing in kind of broader processes around on rural poverty reduction, right? The fact that most smallhold, smallholder producers are in fact diversified, they depend on multiple sources of income, you can't just, you can't just look at them from the, from, the, from the producer side. You also have to realize that they're depending on non-farm sources of income, uh, and, and, um, and so it needs to be done in a much more multi-sectoral, broader, broader approach. No, I think a, a second very important challenge, uh, which I think came out quite, yes, uh, quite clearly yesterday in the, in the presentation by, uh, by Martin, is around the, the, the issue of extreme poverty and who's being left, be, left behind, right? And I think that um, uh, there is a big debate going on in terms of, okay, well, who should be the target beneficiaries? There's many people at FAO who think it should be, we should, we should focus on the productive poor, and I know there's many people at EFAT as well who think you should focus on the productive poor, right? Um, and, um, but I think, in fact, if you really want to focus on SDG 1, right, uh, these are, in fact, the, uh, they're perhaps the, 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 the groups of people that um, we as development ag agencies can perhaps actually have the biggest impact, right? Because I think, I mean, as we, as we learned about yesterday and also in today's presentation, you know, growth addresses a lot of the issues around, uh, around poverty reduction, particularly more broad-based growth. Um, but again, those processes often leave behind the, the, the most extreme poor, right? And so the, the, um, that we, that it's, in a way, I mean, this is our obligation, that we can't just assume that, that uh, you know, the poorest of the poor, that the extreme poor should just be dealt with by uh, social assistance. Um, but in fact, um, their livelihoods, most of their livelihoods, are, again, are, are in agriculture and the subsistence, whether it's in fisheries or forestry or, or in agriculture production, right? I think one of the, the biggest myths is, in fact, that the bottom 10%, that the poorest 10% are not productive, right? And I think this has been shown out by the research that we've been doing, just looking at the uh, beneficiaries of cash transfer programs in sub-Saharan Africa, which tend to be targeted to the bottom 10%. And we find when you give them a cash transfer, an unconditional cash transfer, in fact, a large part of what they do with that money is invest in their, in their, in their crop, in their, in their livelihood, right? In the different aspects of their livelihood. Because that's all they got. There, is no, there are no jobs, right? There, are, there is no formal wage employment. There may be some informal employment. They may depend on agricultural wage labor. But again, that's, uh, those are survival strategies, right? And while this may not be the, the long-term path out of poverty, it is certainly their, their, their current strategy for survival for food security and hunger, right? And so, and there are real technical issues that they face as well. And so, the, and there's a big fight at FAO. You know, and I've had a number of discussions with, uh, with our representatives at the country level. You know, like, for example, I had a discussion with one, the Kenya representative, maybe two years ago, right? Where, we were just, where he was saying, well, you know, we're going to focus on those producers that are having difficulty with market access because of unfair conditions, whatever. And I asked, well, what about, you know, small-scale producers that are mostly subsistence? And he was like, no, 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 those are for WFP to deal with, not for FAO, right? Yeah. And just last week in Latin America, I had another discussion with a, with a, with a representative around uh, uh, the importance of focusing on the extreme poor. And, and he basically said, oh, that's just, you're just being a politically correct, you know, demagogue, basically, right? Um, you know, wanting to support the extreme poor out of political, political correctness. Now, and I think this is, I mean, I, I think it's a fundamental misunderstanding and a stereotype, right, that the bottom 10 percent, that the poorest of the poor are disabled or they're, you know, unable to work or, or what have you, right? And, and I think a lot, of, a lot of these situations, they fake very specific vulnerabilities, whether it's uh, ethnicity, whether it's gender, whether it's different, different uh, marginalized and vulnerable populations that, in fact, perhaps... Uh, Will not, be a, will not be, you can't address them through the classic growth and developmentist approach, and you need to come up with different ways of addressing the livelihoods in their particular context. And so I think this is a big challenge for us at, uh, at FAO is, okay, well, how do we rethink what we do so that we also are, are looking at those and, and responding to their needs as well? Good, good. Can I stop you there? Yeah. Um, I think you're facing many of the same challenges that IFAD faces, and maybe that's um, a very nice uh, introduction into uh, to, to give the floor to Shitra. Shitra, you've recently done a learning study on IFAD's approach to targeting the poor, um, based on evidence from IOE's project evaluations and country evaluations. Why don't you give us some of the main findings from that? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Ed. Um, I thought I'd also segue, um, as opposed to FAO, where there's a challenge and the question about the relevance of rural poverty and targeting. For EFAD, targeting 
is central to our mandate of reducing rural poverty. And it's a key principle of engagement in our strategic framework. And since or from 2007, um, our EFAD's targeting policy requires that all of EFAD's investments, so one billion new investments each year, investment projects, target the poor. So you cannot clear our quality assurance review unless targeting is part of that design. So this is central to EFAD's work. Um, because of this importance and because of mixed evaluative evidence, uh, our executive board last year approved this topic of us focusing as a learning theme uh, in 2018 on targeting, and, uh, targeting to reach the rural poor. And you'll see our issues paper outside, and I encourage you to read it. Um, but I'll just highlight some key findings that we've, we've uh, found. So the first is, is just as what Ben was talking about, you know, EFAD, we're known. We're known for reaching the poorest of the poor. That's what our communications publications tell you. And yet, inside EFAD, there is the roaring debate, as Ed put it. Um, and our, there is clearly a lack of agreement in EFAT that needs to be addressed. And in part, our policy leaves room for interpretation. Our, the EFAT policy states that our target are the rural poor suffering from food insecurity in developing countries. It goes on, though, to say that EFAT strives to reach the extreme poor who can engage in agricultural production and rural enterprises. The productive or economically active poor. <laughs> it leaves room for interpretation, especially as EFAD is increasingly engaging in market-oriented agricultural projects and value chain approaches because are we not, if we're reaching extreme poor, trying to include extreme poor, are we not putting them at risk, um, engaging in market-oriented activities for which they don't have cushions and barriers? Is it one question? But it also, and therefore, should we, you know, in these, in these value chain approaches, are we reaching the extreme poor? So this is a question, and I think clearly from Ben mentioning it, hopefully we'll discuss more. The second finding is that effective targeting strategies are based on differentiated poverty analysis, in particular of excluded groups. So women, youths, indigenous people, pastoralist groups. Um, it's through this differentiated analysis that you can ensure that you build targeting strategies that are realistic, clear, and practical. We found this is especially important in fragile contexts where often the targeting strategies are very ambitious. They're overly ambitious for the context. Briefly on each of these groups, we found the importance of having a, a gender strategy. So it's not enough to just say 50% of our beneficiaries will be women, but clearly having a strategy because that's sort of a trickle-down approach. You can't take a trickle-down approach to reach these groups. You need to have a clear strategy that's context-specific to that, not just country, but that local area to see how you can engage women and other groups in, in your um, agricultural activities. <laughs> The second is for youths. We found that c genuine community development, driven development benefits the youths, especially if it includes rural finance or other um, enterprise activities. And for indigenous people, we, we, sh we strongly uh, found that it's important that the strategies are culturally sensitive and include or recognize their different knowledge systems. Um, and in this, just to link with the first finding, I think we, if we could have this context-specific poverty analysis, there might be a way of finding balance between 
um, value chain approaches and including these groups. So finding, you know, when you're doing a value chain approach, identifying a, co a commodity where women are dominant, the women in that area. And our, though we don't have sufficient um, evaluative evidence, the, the GALS approach, the gender action learning system household approaches, which will be discussed later, I think in the next session, might hold some promise. The third finding highlights the importance of credible poverty data that is acquired through monitoring with um, the appropriate capacities and um, supervision and implementation support. You know, po I, I think it's been said over and over, but having credible poverty data is critical. And what's critical about the proper monitoring and supervision implementation is that we need to be responsive. Targeting strategies need to be flexible. As we've heard, we're living in a rapidly changing environment. The world is changing. And we have projects that are eight to 10 years. A lot happens in a country in that period. And we need to, from design to midterm, ensure that the strategies that were first designed are still relevant. And we found, for example, um, in, some, in, in Mauritius, uh, project design failed to recognize this rapid growth and that the originally targeted households preferred to work not in agriculture but in services and manufacturing in that environment. However, we had another example in Cambodia where at midterm they found that actually most of the um, most of the project was going towards landowners, poor landowners, but the extreme poor were being left out. And so they adjusted the project to identify the extremely poor who needed ID cards. And these ID cards were issued so that they could gain government services. And this was upscaled on a larger level. Finding four confirms that reaching the poorest and the last mile is costly but is necessary if EFAT is going to reach its mandate. It is costly if we are actually going you know, where no one else goes to those remote areas. Um, just as a, an aside, in organizing this conference, I think some of you know I've been involved in that, we couldn't get a visa for one of our grassroots uh, voices. We wanted to bring voices from the field, Violet Shibutse. But in the end, it took, it took so much effort <laughs> to try to even get her an appointment at the visa office, which she couldn't even get. And we tried everything we could, and yet she could not come here today. And why? Because reaching the people who are not part of the system in the same way as global elite is challenging. It takes time. It takes resources. There are logistical challenges. And we need to recognize that. And as we push towards these efficiency goals, we need to recognize that there is going to be a trade-off. Um, and, and if you're going to push for certain efficiency goals and shorter project durations, for example, well, then you can't reach the extreme rapport in the most remote areas. The last finding highlights the importance of government commitment and partnership. So in, in part, it's sort of, one, for government commitment, it's cr crucial. It's crucial for the poverty data, because that way you can have systematic poverty um, data uh, acquisition. It's crucial for engaging in policy dialogue as well to upscale programs. So like in Odisha and in India, we were able to upscale our approach with tribal groups. Um, it's also crucial in terms of, I, and maybe this is room for debate, but it, again, if we're not going to reach the extreme poor partnering with WFP and others, but especially EFAT had a very successful partnership with the Belgian Survival Fund in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the Survival Fund was able to provide the basic needs, and we could complement that with the agricultural production. So partnerships crucial, as well as partnering with local partners, like NGOs, who know the context and so that we can get a better understanding of the field. So I'll, I'll just conclude there. Thank you, Ed. Good, good. Thank you. Um, I think a very, very complimentary points to, to, um, to those that Ben raised um, and lots, lots of food for thought. You, um, what, one of the issues you touched on was um, 
uh, reaching uh, marginalized women, and that's a theme I want to take up more uh, with Michael. Um, you've done some work on, on targeting disempowered rural women in Tunisia, and I think with, with your university uh, comparing Tunisia to Bangladesh, Guatemala, and Uganda. Um, so I have two related questions. First is, uh, what are some of the, the differences and some of the commonalities you see across those, those different countries? Um, and second, it's perhaps looking for um, common patterns in terms of gender issues as countries go from being rural, low-income countries to, to, to middle-income. Um, and I guess you know, the, or the, the, the implication is, do we, do we need to uh, go about targeting uh, from a gender perspective in a different way at different stages of development? Michael. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, we were asked uh, by uh, the ILO and uh, IFAT to uh, calculate the so-called Women's uh, Empowerment in Agriculture Index, which was developed by IFPRI. And so our task was to adapt this to the Tunisian context, which is quite different from the context where this has been implemented so far. You mentioned already Bangladesh, Uganda, and um, uh, Guatemala are the countries where this has been tested. So the index measures uh, women's empowerment across five dimensions relating to production, resources, income, leadership, and time, and then also looks at gender inequality, so how that relates to the empowerment of the primary male household members. So you see here some results in this table for rural Tunisia and then for these uh, three other contexts I mentioned, and you asked about the commonalities. So first... I think it's striking to see across these four countries that uh, in all these countries, female empowerment is uh, lower than uh, men's empowerment, so there's some significant gender inequality here. Um, and this is maybe also striking here if you compare now, and now we come to the differences. If you look at on the top uh, row, you see the uh, GNI per capita, so rural Tunisia, or Tunisia as a country, this is not the GNI for rural Tunisia, but Tunisia is, uh, in fact, much richer than, than all these three countries, and we may expect that you know, female empowerment is, is therefore also higher than uh, in these three countries, but it's not. So why is that the case? Um, so I said empowerment is measured uh, through these uh, five dimensions, and, of course, it's interesting to unpack this and then to look at the different indicators, and then you see that, in particular, in the economic sphere, female empowerment is relatively low in the Tunisian context. So this has several reasons. This, you have to see this in a context where female education has gone up a lot in Tunisia. So nowadays the, the female youth has even higher education level than the, the male youth. Uh, it's in a context where the age at marriage uh, increased, where fertility has gone down. So in fact, quite uh, decent preconditions for higher female empo uh, empowerment. But what you have here is a very low female labor market participation. And this has, on the one hand, to do with a lack of job opportunities that are adequate given the education level of, uh, of the female youth. And it has to do with still uh, gender norms and, and traditions that are in place. The, Tunisia has done a lot of progress in, in terms of the um, legal reform. So a lot happened over the past uh, 10, 15 years. But not everything has put in practice. And so there are still quite traditional gender roles. And given that Tunisia, and this applies to the entire or to large parts of the MENA region, that structural change has been relatively slow. So there's, say, whereas we see in Southeast Asia, or even parts of South Asia, we see emergence of a manufacturing sector and lots of labor market opportunities for <coughs> educated women. We do not see this at that scale in the MENA context. So there's, there's a lack of labor market opportunities, and this combined with these uh, traditional norms make that women are increasingly crowded out of the labor market. And in this survey that we conducted, we also asked, so whether people think that jobs should rather go to men than to women, and we asked this in the urban context, in the rural context, and you find that in the rural context, 60% of the men think so, and, and even 50% of the women think so. But then if you go to the urban area, and in particular to the youth, then you, you find that among the men, still a, a very high share, about 50% think that indeed 
jobs should rather go to men, but only 30% of the women think so. So here you see this tension on the labor market, but given these traditional uh, roles and, and uh, values, at the end, of course, the jobs do indeed go rather to men. So th that's quite interesting in terms of you know, targeting, but then also how to intervene. And now you asked, well, what do we have to expect as, in general, countries um, see economic <coughs> development? So is what we see in Tunisia, and, and I could show the same for other MENA countries, is that uh, a common pattern? And just here, a comparison with a few other countries that have a similar uh, GNI level than Tunisia from various parts of the world, and now I cannot rely on the WIA index because we haven't calculated this for these other countries, but if you take numbers from the Human Development Report where you have the Gender Development Index and the Gender Inequality Index, then you see indeed that these other countries do better on both the gender development and the gender inequality compared to the MENA context. So it's not something that somehow we see uh, everywhere, and these other regions, they have managed to, on the one hand, adapt their norms to soften traditional norms and also to provide uh, labor market opportunities for women. So that means from a policy perspective, um, well, acting towards you know, raising awareness for these issues, but then also pushing more for structural change and somehow developing value chains that offer or provide labor market opportunities, and here in particular in the MENA context, safe workplaces, uh, reputational safety, uh, and so on for women that are adapted could certainly uh, bring forward female empowerment. And I think I stop here. Thanks. Great, thank you. I think that's given us a, a sort of, um, um, well, less an institutional picture and more a, um, a picture of realities on the ground, and I think that, that, that's really helpful. And I think it's one which um, Estrella is going to Association has mem member organizations from across Asia. Maybe I need to use this. Is it working? Sometimes. Um, typically, farmers' organizations uh, tend to exclude the, the poorest in rural communities. Um, and so I guess the question to you is, how do your members try and bring in and represent the interests of, of marginalized groups, and, and how do you help them in that process? One. Um, what? Yeah. Why okay? don't you take this in case? Okay. Maybe I have two. Okay. 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 So I think you have two questions for me, and for the first question, my answer is: we try to bring in the most excluded groups through organizing, motivating them, and facilitating partnerships among various stakeholders. So almost all, all of our members are organized into village, then commune or town, and then province or district, and then national level. And the national level federation is the member of our regional farmers association. And organizing the farmers means doing awareness raising about their rights, facilitating their analysis and understanding about their issue and problem, and then facilitating discussions and action points on how they can help themselves through partnerships with others. So it's helping them ask the question, analyze the question, and then act on the solution, and then advocate. So we have four A's. So for example, for example, we have the, soup, the farmers from Sumilao, it's a, it's a town in Bukidnon, south part of the country. Uh, these farmers, 100, composed of 100 households, were landless uh, from the indigenous community called Higaunon. So for 20 years, they have struggled <coughs> to get rights to their ancestral lands. The national organization, which is a member of AFA, uh, the name is Pakisama, helped in their struggle through first organizing them, and of course all the consultations, awareness raising about their rights under the Philippines Comprehensive 
Agrarian Reform Program and the Law on Agrarian Reform. And then, we, the Pakisama mobilized the support of the larger civil society, including the local NGOs and the local church in the area. Then we spot leaders and champions in this community and village. These leaders and champions are then trained, for example, as paralegals so that they can get affidavits from the members. They can ask their members to sign by thumb marks, for example. They can interpret the laws to their members who cannot read. Then these leaders and champions are trained on advocacy <laughs> strategies and tactics because to get to claim land rights even even if we have a law or even we have a program we have to fight for it in the philippines it is not given on a silver platter so when the sumila farmers decided on a particular action whether it was a hunger strike they did a 20-day hunger strike and the last one was walking 1,000 kilometers from their home village to Manila, to where the president lives. The national FO was there to help. Okay. Help in ensuring that they had food, for example, during the 1,000 kilometer march. Ensure that they have a place to sleep by mobilizing the church in each town that they will, that they will uh, stay through the night. Ensure that their voices are heard, so checking media, local media, for example, getting media interviews for them, getting media coverage whenever they do a stop in each province or city, and do backdoor advocacy with the National Agrarian Reform Department, who is to decide on the matter. So 10 years ago, these Sumilaw farmers received their lands. The chair of this Sumilao Farmers, is, his name is Noland Peñas. Noland because his father, when he was born, he had no land. Okay. So now we are teasing him. Now your name is Widland. Okay. In 1998, at the height of the hunger strike, it's 20 year, 23 year struggle. In 1998, the advocacy of the Sumilao Farmers prompted Congress to continue the agrarian reform program of the government. So the National FO used or capitalized the advocacy and the struggle of Sumila farmers to get a policy in place so that millions can benefit. Last year, the Sumila farmers celebrated their 10th year of getting their ancestral lands, their victory, 10th year victory. And when we visited their area, uh, la this January, we saw that they are organized already into a cooperative. They are producing corn coffee from out of their organic uh, corn production. And they have a tractor that was granted by the government. And then their houses were, are now made of concrete or semi-concrete. In the 1990s, all were touched nipa hats and then and these are some of the tangible impact that we saw okay so with the sumilo story sumilo story we say that organizing bringing how we bring in the members we do organizing motivating education work not only for securing their rights but also in what to do with the land when they get the land so through, for example, integrated, diversified, organic farming practices and through cooperatives because it is through cooperatives that they will get better prices for their uh, crops and also do some value addition and processing. Like in Sumilao, they have uh, organic corn coffee and which is being marketed in the, uh, local, local shops in the in the vicinity. So, with regards to organizing as cooperatives in the Philippines also, we established last year a National Agri-Cooperative Federation. 
in which 25 primary cooperatives are members, and the Sumilaw Cooperative is a part of this National Agri-Coop Federation. The National Agri-Coop Federation is composed not only of the primary agriculture cooperatives, but the bigger multi-purpose multi cooperatives. So because of their membership in this national federation, there becomes complementarities. So one cooperative that specializes in financing is now will able through the National Agri Co-op Federation will now be able to service the members of the other 25 cooperatives in access to finance and loans. One member, one member is specializing on value addition and packaging, so it will help the other, the rest of the membership of this national federation on processing, branding, and packaging of their products. One member who is, we think, the largest pig or hog raisers uh, cooperative in the Philippines will uh, train interested members of the 25 cooperatives who would like to start hog raising business. So with the National Agri-Coop Federation that was established, we see a big brother, big sister, and little brother, little sister uh, help, no? help. Because those who have the, the services of the bigger cooperatives will be directed to the smaller ones because they are now members of one big uh, federation. In the second question, how do we represent the interests of the marginalized groups? Of course, we organize ourselves as legitimate in a legitimate and transparent manner with clear accountabilities. We have regular elections, we have regular general assembly, uh, execo meetings, every meeting is a venue to get, con to get the ideas, the issues, the situation of our members. And once we get them, we package them as policy briefs, as uh, issue papers, and we use this, we refer to this uh, proceedings, documentation, and issue papers whenever we represent the organization in meetings and international conferences. So, on the second question, that's how we do it. We, we, rep we represent the interest through organizing and regular consultations with our members. Great. Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, most of us in this room are quite good at writing about rural development or even talking about rural development, but it's great to hear from you who's actually working directly or rural communities and increasing their agency. Sure, sure. Okay, so we've had four uh, sort of opening pitches which have covered sort of issues around infusing and diffusing a, a targeting perspective into the work of a, a, a hitherto largely technical organization. We've pulled out some lessons learnt about targeting in the context of an organization that for which targeting is absolutely central. Um, we've heard a little bit about the dimensions of, of uh, women's disempowerment in, in uh, rural Tunisia. Um, and we've heard now about, about how the Asian Farmers Association um, has helped marginalized rural communities to, to organize to, to, uh, and, uh, to advocate for their rights. Um, I think what we'd like to do now is, is turn the floor over to you. Um, there, are, there is the possibility of writing questions down. There is the possibility of joining people, uh, joining, joining us on, in one of these very comfortable chairs. <laughs> or there is the possibility of simply asking a question. Yes, I see a first question. Okay, it's working now. Um, I had uh, comments in all, all presentations, but in, 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 to honour our, our host, I'll focus on the IFAD uh, presentation. My, my first reaction was, was total alarm at what you were saying, uh, the focus on targeting and so on. And, and, and as I said yesterday, I mean, we've just got to relax about this idea. You know, the objective is poverty reduction. 
But actually, the, when, I, when I hear you, uh, I think you're using targeting in a somewhat different way, to the, which relax, makes me relax, a bit more relaxed. I think really your dilemma is, is what is your objective function defined on the set of poor people in some sense. So it's a weighting issue. How do you weight the poorest versus the not so poor? Uh, and my advice to you is to use the mean growth rate across all of the poor, which gives you the change in the Watts index, which is the best known poverty measure on the planet. Okay? Simple solution. Now, implementing that, very difficult. But in the process of implementing that, the choice of policies relax about targeting. Targeting understood in my narrow sense, my first reaction, understood as only focusing on policies which explicitly, carefully identify a particular target group within that distribution. And the reason I say this is, well, think about the very poorest. So this is not, if you really put all the weight on the very poorest person, which is not what I'm recommending, although I think we need to put very high weight on the poorest, that's not what I'm saying. Um, ask yourself, how did, how did rich countries lift the floor? How did they reach the poorest people in the world? Believe me, when they were as poor as, say, sub-Saharan Africa today, they didn't use targeting. They used much more universal provision, much more broad-based, not always, but sometimes with a fairly clear causal model linking intervention to outcomes, which may include understanding the general equilibrium of the whole economy, and not this narrow focus on targeting. Why they didn't use the narrow focus on targeting is they couldn't because they really didn't have the information. And I actually don't think we have the kind of information you would need to do that now. I'd like to bundle that, that question with the first one I see on, 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 this, uh, on the screen here. There's an ongoing discussion on universal social protection programs. Are there contexts where, contexts where universal programs are, uh, are better at um, pro-poor targeting? Um, so maybe I can throw those two back to Shitra and, and to any of the others if they want to, to respond immediately. Yeah, I, think, I think this is the raging debate. I think it's okay. Um, in fact, because... Uh, you know, again, it's the context, and so we have in our country portfolio some countries like in sub-Saharan Africa who are saying everyone is poor. Why are you know why do we need to target particular groups? And and then you have other um, countries where the, like middle-income countries, and depending on the government, so you have governments like China, India, Pakistan who have very detailed categorizations of their poor, the ultra poor the reasons why they're poor, et cetera. And so that makes it much easier for us to implement. Um, so, I mean, I think this is, uh, uh, this is, a, is a raging debate. And the question really comes to, and, and I, I just want to bring out, but you know, back to, in a sense, the efficiency question. And it's a question about shrinking ODA, right? And, and governments trying to take their scarce resources and ensure that it's going to the most worthy. And so then we have these issues. This is, I think yesterday, if you sat in on Lisandro Martin's presentation, you know, IFAD has a, a performance-based allocation system to determine how our, 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 our three billion every three years, where do they go, you know, to the most neediest, the best performing countries, et cetera. And so, Again, so it's a question in, it's more of a, probably for a government perspective, I think it's moving more towards, I think, what you're saying, Martin, and sort of how you would advise a government. And then on another hand, it's like agencies like EFAD and others in a shrinking context of, of, of development aid, you know, how do, where do we put our resources? Um, what are taxpayers willing to, to put their money towards? And so whether, whether we want to open that up and say, well, does that really matter is something I think I'll just open also for, for, for debate. Um, and on the, I, I think sort of, yeah, the, the, I'll just leave it at that and, and open it to my colleagues here. The, um, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I hear very much what you're saying in terms of the, the targeting and not focusing on, I mean, just to give an example, the CCT, you know, conditional cash transfer, emphasis on finding the exact right person. But I think even when you look at the issue of, of and ultimately, obviously, universal programs are preferable, right? But I think even universal social, uh, education, universal whatever, 
it, it can't be implemented in a in a in a in a in a. I mean, there is there is extra. There, there's always extra cost to going the extra mile to getting those who typically, even in a, under a universal program, will miss out, right? And so, even if you have universal education, there still might be five, ten percent who aren't getting it for a variety of reasons because they face other constraints, right? Whether they're constraints in terms of they don't have the clothes to go to school or they don't have the money to take the bus or whatever, right, to get to school. And so even a universal program needs to have additional things which help those on the margins access the universal program, right? So that isn't targeting in terms of finding the, you know, the last person, but it certainly is recognizing that different Different people face different constraints and different vulnerabilities that need to be addressed by public policy in addition to a universalist policy. And so I think, so I think that's a fundamental, uh, I think that's important to realize that just being universal doesn't solve the problem. You need to have specific policies which address specific constraints. Um, and I think also that, the, <clears throat> and again, when, when we talk about the, I think it's important to look at, okay, who are, I mean, if you look at the cases of China, if you look at the cases of Vietnam, who are those who, who are being left behind, right? And they're often those who can't be reached by the, you know, let's say, let's call it the developmentist model, right? And so there are people who are geographically isolated, they're ethnic minorities, they're people who may have a, who face different constraints by which the classic, you know, poverty reduction approach can't reach them. And so you need to come up with a different approach which means targeting in the sense of this is a specific group of specific vulnerabilities that need a specific approach, right? And so I think in that sense, you clearly do need targeting, not in the CCT, you know, find the last person, but certainly at different people fa face different vulnerabilities and constraints that have to be addressed. Sure. I see Michael, very keen, and, and then Estrella. Very briefly on this, I think it's not so much the question whether it's targeted or universal, it's where do you get the highest return for the poor? If you think, say, take the example of a, of a credit, so you can give this to an ultra-poor person who definitely has not or may not have the, the, somehow the ability to run a firm, and so this will not develop, this will not grow. But you could also give the credit to the entrepreneur next door who is already at a, at a different stage, and this person may provide the job for this uh, poor person, and at the end you have reached more than if you had targeted these resources at this uh, poor. So I think it's a question, where do you get the, the highest return? So how does it, at the end, you know, trickle down or adjoin, or reach the poor? Yeah. Estrella, do, do you want to come in? <laughs> yes, uh, uh, but I want to answer that question there. Is it okay? <laughs> or no? <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, let's come back to that question. Okay. Let's come back to that question. You wanted a, a, a quick wanted... final word on this one, did well, you? Well, no, just, on the, just to react on the, just to say um, in part in our targeting, you know, again, it's that the trickle down was sort of a sensitive point that I sort of jumped in because in fact, you know, and, I, and what we're finding is you can't just rely it will trickle down. And that's what we meant by you need to have the strategies to ensure that that person who you've given money to actually will hire the ultra poor who maybe needs to learn how to read or needs to, you know, other needs. And so that's where EFAD would come in to ensure that that linkage is made. Just needed to say that. If, um, uh, let's go to th this question. Estrella, you're, you wanted to respond to yes, this I one which to keeps disappearing. Yes, I want to respond to that, that, that disappearing question about the even relation on the economic empowerment. That one. Since economic empowerment cannot be separated from political empowerment, how can FAO EFAD support empowering the voices of the poor? And, I would like to answer and, and that question. And before you do, I would like you to take it with this other question. What role do I be? Oh, damn, <laughs> We're stopping it. Hold on. <laughs> Joe, Joe is holding it, slowing it down. What role do RBAs have in, in working with CSOs? What is RBA? Uh, yes. What is RBA? That, that no, address and fight against structural no, inequality. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so first, I think, uh, yeah, economic empowerment, political empowerment, social empowerment, they are very much interrelated. Okay, so, but, and we think that uh, we can merge these three when we organize farmers into cooperatives. Because when we organize farmers into cooperatives, they can, uh, cooperatives are always democratic institutions, the true cooperatives. Are democratic institutions, and they have and they have uh, they they have uh, resources, for example, for education, 
for, for membership expansion. They can do advocacy work with their governments through their cooperatives. And if they have funds, they may not purely rely on grants, but on themselves. Okay? And when cooperatives especially do economic services to their members, and like, for example, value addition, access to markets, providing loans and providing credit, that, that, then that helps in the economic empowerment of the poor. So if IFAD and FAO could support farmers to, to, to build and strengthen cooperatives, I think that is the way to go. We, are, we, we have developed an equation. Okay, can I share with you? Our equation is I for inclusive rural development equals C, that means cooperative, times, times uh, parenthesis L plus S. L is land. It's very important for farmers to have land, okay, to have rights to land. And S is support services. Support services will come in for like physical infrastructure. Even if we have land, if we don't have road, it's very difficult for us to go to the market. Or support services like storage facilities, harvest facilities, equipments, okay? equipments, training. So C is cooperative times L plus S parenthesis times P, partnership. Because we cannot do it alone. We don't have the money. We cannot buy the tractor. We don't have the, the training. So we need to get people to, to do trainers training. We, we need research. So all the agri-research institutions, they can come and help us. Uh, so partnerships. Okay. Over, over, <laughs> V equals vulnerabilities. We know we are vulnerable, climate change, price shocks. So all the support, the L plus S times P, should be able to be bigger, bigger than our vulnerability so that we can really be inclusive and we can really lift ourselves from poverty. Thank but you. the main question is, but the main, main uh, message is, please help us help ourselves. Thank, Thank you. you. Good. I will go and test the equation in the office <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> I saw lots of hands earlier. Um, let's get somebody from outside, outside EFAD, please. You. No, I know who you are. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, just uh, one, one uh, remark. I don't know. that. Uh, I think we need to uh, reflect a bit more on the role of um, developing agencies or international financial institutions in raising inequality in rural areas. <laughs> because I agree not with Martin Havayon that uh, I mean, there are, we need to look at the targeting or our, I mean, the, the way to reduce inequality in both ways. The government's role, the state's role uh, um, in, in implementing public policies that are inclusive, let's say. But in, in many countries and in developing countries, uh, I mean, the interventions rely much more on developing agencies than public policies due to their, uh, uh, the government uh, difficulties in raising funds. So in many cases, the interventions uh, from uh, international financing organizations like World Bank, IFAD, and many others, if not well targeted to the poorest, can have an impact in increasing inequality. I think this is another, this is not only trickle, the trickle down effect can, can have uh, 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 an opposite effect. And I think uh, we need to really reflect more on our roles on this aspect, when not only how to target, but how to avoid this impact of increasing inequality through our interventions, our big investments. Yeah. Um, thank you, yes. Um, Let's, let's keep that one sort of bubbling for a while, and, and perhaps we want, you want to reflect on it, but let's get some others. I, th I think you had your hand up, did you? Thank you. Yes, uh, one of the, of the issues uh, on targeting is just to make visible those invisible. 
And if we don't have this kind of approach, they are going to remain invisible, at least those the most vulnerable. But when we say vulnerable, we are also hiding some of the strengths these people have. They are capable people, they have knowledge, when we refer to indigenous peoples, for instance. So it depends on the approach and how we can reach them and how we can bring them to, 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 to leverage this level, no? And this is something very important on the policies that we and the approach we are uh, uh, delivering on, on employment creation, for instance. How can we uh, provide them employability skills, uh, recognizing these strengths so they can be employable? If we don't have this information of those that are left behind, they are going to continue. Um, <laughs> Invisible. So I, I agree with you. This trickle-down policy doesn't doesn't reach them. So we have to to see how we can develop appropriate tools to really reach them, but to um, to come with them, not to to see them as the poor, but as knowledgeable and capable people. That's the point. I see a, an old friend of Efed over there in the distance. Thank you, Ed. Um, the, the cost of targeting has been frequently underestimated, and also the benefits, because yeah. what is coming out from evaluations frequently is that ex-ante targeting is very different from ex-post targeting, that there has been an illusion of targeting in some cases. So in this context, I would like to ask you if you have any experiences on self-targeting, which in the context of inequality may be of some interest. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take one last question, two last questions, <laughs> and then um, ask, ask uh, my panelists to, to sort of synthesize some of the things they've heard. Um, yes. Yes, thank you. It um, echoes a bit the discussion, um, and also on being realistic when targeting. I uh, wanted to share you our experience from the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. In Nepal, we have gone the furthest in terms of targeting uh, in our previous country strategy, which was really focusing on not only the poor, but also on the intersect with the excluded. So it is uh, in Nepal, the lower caste. Uh, so it had to be within the two categories. But when it came to implement this, it became very tricky and difficult. And they went very far. Even our country office was to reflect the diversity in terms of caste within our um, staff members. And uh, that was not an easy task to have a you know, cross-sectional representation of, of the different castes and gender in, in Nepal. And now with the new strategy which we are just being developed, we had to relax on, on, on this to become more realistic. So um, be happy to hear other experiences of, mm. from the panelists on this. Okay. And uh, last question, Lauren. Thank you. Um, I loved the equation that you presented. It was great. But sometimes I think when we talk about um, conditional cash transfers or social protection, we forget that the state itself might lack the capacity to implement the program. Um, and that's another different role for agencies to play in strengthening the state. I'll give you an example. Guatemala has a conditional cash transfer program. The state doesn't provide sufficient health services for people to fulfill the conditions which have to do with taking children to be vaccinated. So if there's no local health service, you can't fulfill the conditions and you can't receive conditional cash transfers. So this is a matter of coordination of multi-sectoral uh, work and, and state capacity. And I wondered if anybody has any thoughts on that. Thank you. Great. Okay, we've got a whole set of issues that, that um, I would ask each of you to you know, reflect on whichever bits you like. We've got what seems to me a, a really fundamental question on, on how do we... Uh, unknowingly uh, increase inequalities through, through our investments. Um, we've got a set of issues around um, employability and, and um, identifying tools that respond to the specific assets and, and constraints faced by 
marginalized groups. Um, some reflections on, on self-targeting as a specific approach to, 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 to targeting. Um, some thoughts about the complexity of, of, of targeting uh, relative to, to caste. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then this last one on, on uh, state capacity, which of course is particularly relevant for, for an organization like EFED that works, th works through principally through, through public sector agencies. So, uh, Ben, let me start with you um, and address whichever of those you want, all of them if you like, and anything else, anything else that comes to mind. Okay. I mean, j just, a, just a few things to, to reemphasize. I think, I mean, in terms of the issue of targeting, I mean, I think there's, there's two dimensions for me to focus. One is, and this goes back to the time when I worked with UNICEF and UNICEF's attitude towards, I mean, they supported univer universal programs but they saw targeting as a way as the, as the progressive realization of, of, of a universal program, right? So you start with the most vulnerable with the goal of, of having eventually a universal program. Because I think ultimately universal is, is the way to go, but mm -hmm. this recognition that, the, that, that no universal, again, as I said before, um, uh, uh, given transaction costs, given the constraints that people face, uh, you have to focus, whether you call it targeting or not, you need to focus and realize and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and relax these constraints so that people can access uh, universal programs. Um, I think second, and which is, which is uh, related for us at FAO, is that we can't continue with business as usual because business as usual is essentially um, recognizing, is, is, is ignoring what, what are the distributional impacts of our work, right? And so it's trying to infuse us with a consciousness that our work is, no, is not neutral. Technology is never neutral. Our work in crop and whatever, in fisheries, forestry, is not neutral by definition. And, and you need to make that explicit, I think, in terms of understanding what your impact yeah. is. And if you, really want to, if you really want to have an impact on SDG 1, which is eliminating extreme poverty, which we've all agreed to, right? I mean, that's our main purpose as as development agencies, then we need to make that explicit, and we can't just let it. Um, we we can't just let it happen. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Future. Yeah. Um, I'll just. Yeah, I'll, maybe I'll start with the self-targeting uh, question a bit because um, just from what we've seen and just briefly, I think we have a mixed bag of results from self-targeting. I and mean, We've had good examples of self-targeting working and it works well very much with indigenous peoples and in giving the poor to self-identify um, you know, what their needs are or who who in the group might require you know the most help and what kind of what kind of needs they have but we've also had negative um, you know uh, results from self targeting I think self targeting in Georgia for example um, was not very effective because there were certain assumptions that uh, it's kind of gender blind assumptions and so women's needs weren't really taken into account so they w they didn't identify mechanisms to include women. Um, we also see self-targeting needs time. And so in Haiti, there was uh, self-targeting was introduced when targeting initially wasn't working. So this is something that we have a mixed results. It takes time, though, I think, is um, and a, a better understanding of the context. Um, just, uh, I think, let's see, I think, I don't know, just reminding me of the other issues. That, uh, um, there was this issue, which for me is absolutely central, uh, Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, again, just from the evaluative lens, I think that's what we're finding, in fact. We're not really looking at inequality in our, when we look at our indicators. Um, and so this is partly kind of a, a raison d'etre of this conference, you know. Are we looking at how, when we're pursuing rural poverty reduction, are we looking at whether we're impacting inequality? For IFAD, we've done a very good job at looking at gender inequality, and we have policies on uh, gender policy, and then we have an indigenous people's policy to, to ensure that we have those checks, and we're ensuring access, equal access, and ownership, et cetera. But we're really not in our, you know, at the end of an evaluation, we're not looking at, at inequality. And so I think this is also why we're having this conference to see, are you? Are other agencies or government looking at inequality, and should we? And so that comes to the question at the end of the day as well of what should we do about this? Thanks. 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, I have to say that it's, it's a, a profound concern of mine that we know little or nothing about the dynamics of the rural societies that we set into motion through our projects. And if it's true for EFAD, it's true for all of the other IFIs as well. Uh, and, I, and I do think it's an issue we need, to, we need to get to grips with. We need to understand what's happening in those rural communities. Michael, before I hand over to you, there was a very specific question for you. Um, the Women's uh, Empowerment and Agriculture Index is gaining traction as a measure of gender empowerment. How long does it take to assess and, and how long does it take? So could you infuse, infuse an answer into, uh, to that into your broader response to the other issues? Okay, so maybe first specifically on this. Uh, in fact, we are doing surveys a bit everywhere and in, in a quite regular manner. So these are questions that you can relatively easily integrate in any household survey. Uh, so whenever you do these surveys, there's not really a lot of additional costs, and also calculating this is not a major effort. So I would say, you know, as long as you have these uh, data collection initiatives in place, there's not really an extra cost. But I also think we should not only focus on the we are. I mean, there are a lot of other things that we need to make informed decisions. So it's one among many other indicators, and it only makes sense if you also unpack it and if you look really what is behind. But I wanted to make, make one more general point, on, again, on the targeting. So I think that we need um, somehow to rebalance a bit, again, between targeted policies and broader economy-wide reform. And I think we need, again, uh, more emphasis on industrial policy as well, maybe, or certainly not to the extent, maybe, as Justin Lin has uh, promoted this, but it's hard to see. I mean, I talked about Tunisia, about the MENA region at large, and we talked this morning a lot on Africa. I mean, it's hard to see how with these very specific, targeted, uh, small-scale policies, we could generate the, the jobs that are needed to um, you know, make this demographic a burden that, that we see coming up there, a demographic gift. So I think... There needs to be, again, a bit, yeah, a rebalance of the discussion and, and interventions. Estrella, um, would you like to, 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 um, to come back to any of these? And, of course, please give us a, a reality check from, from your perspective. Actually, when we go to the rural area, the first, thing, the first that we ask are some of the village leaders and key informants. Mm -hmm. And most of them, they know. They will know. Uh, the inequalities in the village, who, who have lands, who have more chicken or more cows or more pigs, or they, they will know. So the first thing that we do is to do like, for example, with some key informants in the community, do a, like a wealth map or an asset map, okay. and then try to see who among these people in the, in the poorest we can consult so that we can know what they think and what, what they can do. So um, I, I, we think in, in projects such as IFAD, it, it's, it will be good to also really target, but we hope that uh, farmers' organizations can be really part of the process of targeting especially local farmers' groups who have a, a very good knowledge of the realities in the area. Good, thank you. I'm sorry to say we've come to the end of this session. Um, it was an hour, but I think it could very easily have been two hours. Um, I'm sorry it's not longer, and I'm sorry that more of you who wanted to speak weren't able to. I thank you to all of you for participating, um, and please join me in, in thanking Ben, Shitra, Michael, and Estrella for, uh, for leading the discussion. <laughs>